So last week, Mabel and I had the pleasure of going to the American Museum of Natural History and seeing their brand new space show. I guess every five years, they roll out a new show. And it was super immersive, so cool. It's like you're in the domed like planetarium and these like images are like shooting across. Like it feels like you're there in space. Yeah, it was so cool. Ren and I were talking about how it's been so long since we've been to a planetarium and it was just like so beautiful. I felt like we were there on like a first date or something. It was like really <laughs> it is romantic. romantic. <laughs> the stars, like gazing up at the stars with someone. I turned to Mabel at the end and I was like, okay, whoever came up with the idea for the sphere in Vegas was definitely had gone to a planetarium. I was like, I have an amazing idea because it really, it literally feels almost like you're moving. You guys, we are in the planetarium. It's so pretty. We're so excited to see the film, Encounters in the Milky Way. And the space show was so cool. It was narrated by Pedro Pascal. So it had this like little like star factor to it. And what made it so cool was that while the team was making the space show, they actually made a real space discovery that changes how we see the galaxy. Yeah, they discovered that the Oort cloud that surrounds our solar system is actually a spiral shaped and nobody knew that until they were making this movie. And so the American Museum of Natural History actually reached out to us and told us about this discovery and invited us to the show and we were so excited. And they set up an interview for us with acclaimed astrophysicist and senior scientist at the museum and curator of this brand new space show, Dr. Jackie Faherty. Okay, so Jackie, can you walk us through the process of making this show for the planetarium. It just sounds like such a cool job. Yeah, I've never made a movie before. <laughs> not, I'm not a movie maker, but what I am is a planetarium person. And what we, we have this amazing planetarium here in New York City called the Hayden Planetarium. There's a lot that's happening in astronomy and I stories that I feel like you guys should know. I like to call it the science that hasn't reached your textbook yet. And we're going to give it to you in a Hollywoodized take. <laughs> We had a writer, we had a director, we had a technical director, we had a producer, we had an executive producer, and we would sit in a room and we would talk through what the story would look like. Where do we start? How do we make the, sure the concepts aren't too high, but that are high enough that people will walk away and be like, "That's that was something, that they were beautiful, that it also made you feel things when you were in there. So it was a very, very creative process from the start all the way to the end. Uh, and as the scientist, it was my job both to ensure that we never got any of the science wrong. What was the story you were hoping to tell? It's called Encounters in the Milky Way. Yeah. So I, sometimes I think of it as a little bit like a Dr. Seuss story. And one of them is like, oh, the places you'll see and the places you'll go. And I thought of that as kind of what this was. It's, oh, the places you see and all oh, the places you'll go because you're in motion. Because you right now, us, all three of us are tied to this rock that we call Earth. We're mm -hmm. spinning around. We're moving around the sun. But then our sun is catapulting through the galaxy at a speed that we can't comprehend because it's moving very fast for us as it takes a trip, 230 million years for it to do one lap around the galaxy. We don't get to see all that much of the journey, but on this show, we get to show you. So the concept is motion and time and taking you on an epic journey over time that you don't get to experience because the human lifetime is just too limited. What was like the most different kind of experience for you? Because you say, you, you know, this was a really creative process and you're mostly rooted in the science part. You had to work with lots of different kinds of people, like artists and producers and astronomers. Yeah, the thing that I was like so psyched about was working with the technical directors. I wish I had them working on my research team every day. Because what they're able to do with a data set is bring to life these concepts and this look that as astronomers, we struggle to do with each other because we're just kind of limited in our tools and the mathematics behind it is far more important. That to me was the key, the visual artists. It was also, I would say, the audio was quite appealing. So we would be remiss if we didn't ask, how did the narrator Pedro Pascal come to be? All of us wrote down, all of us on the core team wrote down the names of people we thought would be amazing. My number one was Pedro Pascal. 
my top reason is because he's Chilean and the world's best telescopes are in Chile. Right around me in my office, you can see these images of telescopes I go to a lot. And they're all in South America and Chile. He was available. He does sci-fi. He's handsome. So <laughs> that's all you need. <laughs> it, you don't need that for the show, but it helps. <laughs> the internet also loves him. You and your team ended up making a scientific discovery while you were creating the show. Can you tell us about the discovery, like how you made it, how you came across it? What we do show in, in the space show is this scene that no one's ever visualized before, and that is the solar system's Oort cloud, which is the leftover material from when the solar system formed. So when solar systems form, it's not like the planets are formed and that's it. And then all the area around you is cleared. There's all this leftover scraps that could have formed a planet or could have formed an asteroid belt or could have smashed back into the sun, uh, but it didn't. And it's just held gravitationally by the sun. And it goes out pretty far. It goes out over a light year in radius, like a light year and a half in radius. So all around us, and it's our solar system because it's all still held on by the gravitational force of our sun. So we went to the world's leading expert in visualizing the Oort cloud, best simulation anyone's ever done on the Oort cloud. But he hadn't looked at it in 3D. So we were doing these volumetric renderings of it. There's this weird shape inside of it. What's with the spiral structure in the Oort cloud? an S shape that was in there. And he's like, what are you talking about a spiral? I've never seen that before. And then he digs into the data and immediately sees it. And basically his quote was, it was there in the math, but we needed the visuals to pull it out. Do we know when it formed? Like how old, like the or how long the or cloud has been in this like structure? The shape? Oh, shape. great yeah. In the simulation, now we can run it forward and backwards and see over time if that S shape dissipates. The Oort cloud itself is as old as the solar system. So it's four and a half billion years old, the same age that we are, because it formed when we formed. And does this change at all? You mentioned for most of us on Earth who aren't studying astronomy, we hear of the Oort cloud really only when comets come close to to Earth. Does this change at all how we should think about comets like coming into our orbit we can use the structure to help us understand if our solar system we're going to get dynamically evolved you know like one of the things you want to know if another star flies by and we do have a scene of this in the space show and it disrupts our Oort cloud and it just sort of scatters all of our stuff out that's like our leftover material that ended up becoming life. Our solar system is the only one that we know has life in it. So you're going to want those ingredients. <laughs> those are That's the OG ingredients of life, whatever's in the Oort cloud, because it's the OG stuff that created the solar system. That's going to get scattered out. It gives yeah. you the right starting point for creating all sorts of long thought experiments on how to consider the universe maybe the evolution of life in the universe. That's what makes this discovery so cool is that this data was kind of sitting there and then you you guys came in and did some reanalysis and just discovered it and it was just like laying dormant for a while. What other discoveries could just be sitting there in data waiting to be found, like seen with new eyes? So many, even in this space show, there's so much to discover. The last like 10 minutes of the show, We show this simulation that no one's ever created before. It took us almost a year on a supercomputer to run this simulation. And if you come to our planetarium, to the Hayden, you'll see it at the highest possible resolution we could give it to you at. There hasn't been enough time for us astronomers to look at that simulation and pull out everything that we're seeing. So you can come and look and then see something. Maybe you're gonna see a star forming bubble interacting with another one and have some dynamical interaction that makes you scratch your head and say, why did those clouds interact like that? 